Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Driving Successful Document Management in Construction. I'm your host, Evan Hill, along with Matt Sprague. We are both product marketers at Trimble. Now, our voices may sound a little bit familiar if you are listening to our Connecting Construction podcast. So we are back for today's webinar. Super excited about the lineup, the content, the presentation, and even the Q&A that we're going to do today. Before we get started at all, I wanna hand it off to my colleague, Matt Sprague, to give us a little bit of an announcement on how we're going to handle today's Q&A. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, so I am your Q&A caddy for, for today's webinar. Um, I will be off camera shortly, so you don't have to look at my mug any farther. Uh, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold off all questions until the end after we have three short presentations to go through. Um, of which time I will be spending the entire time going through and, and either answering one straight forward or being able to queue them up for uh, the list of questions at the end. So please make sure uh, within the GoToWebinar uh, interface, find the questions area and feel free to ask your questions as they come through and I'll be on the end kind of curating them for the end of the presentations. That's it for me. Thanks, Matt. So questions, like Matt said, are more than welcome. Please drop them in the chat box throughout throughout the webinar, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, a couple of other administrative items before I introduce our wonderful guests. Today's rep webinar will be recorded and will be sent to you over email. So if you have to drop for some reason halfway through, obviously we don't hope you do. We hope you stick through the entire conversation. There's going to be some really good content we're going to share with you. But if you have to drop for some reason, we will send it to you over email. It will be viewable on demand in case you want to share it with a colleague, a coworker, a boss, or someone else. Um, you also will receive a certificate of completion and attendance once the webinar is complete. That will also be delivered to your email. On to our speakers. So I would like to first introduce our uh, very first speaker, Lisa Ruggieri. I hope I pronounced that last name correctly. I have been practicing it a thousand times over over the past couple of days. Yeah, let me just make sure this, this uh, presentation moves to the next slide here. Lisa is going to talk about all the basics of document management, and then we will move on to Michael Weber and Dan Connery, and then a following Q&A. So with that said, um, Kellen, if you could manually move to the next slide, it's stuck on my screen. Um, so Lisa can begin her presentation. Great, thank you. And I can I can start um, while we're catching the slides up. Um, so I'm Lisa Ruggieri and I happen to lead our professional services organization um, here and um, I'm excited to join you today to discuss a little bit about document management. You know, kind of frame the problem and say, you know, you know, is your document management system failing you? And, you know, what's the importance of this, of a document management system? And, and then we'll talk a little bit about best practices, the importance of that, and, and then also just some basics in document management. So, um, you know, what is a document management system? And I, I think that this is a problem we've had for many years, um, especially when you think about in construction projects and programs, a number of participants, they have to collaborate on projects, um, you know, where we've had centralized management of documents in some forms, it could be on the desk or, you know, certainly file cabinets. And then we evolved to the, you know, in drive or D drive, a local drive on a, on a network. And then um, now we are at the point where we can do all of this digitally and certainly through um, eBuilder as an example, a project management information system. So what is document management? It really is just a system used to receive, track, manage, and store documents. Um, it's it's um, pretty fundamental, basic and fundamental in it, at its core. Um, but what's the challenges around that? Having a system doesn't always solve the problem. It's, you know, um, what FMI uh, reported in construction projects. Um, we spent like 31.3 billion, I have the stat here on the slide, in 2018 on document accuracy. That's what it cost our projects. Um, so clearly having a system um, isn't enough. And those without a system, obviously that's even less mature and less desirable than even if you have a system. So, um, 
you know, one of the important things to think about um, when it comes to document management is, you know, what are some of the things that you want to track? Um, because you really want to reduce your risk. You want to get accessible at any time and, you know, anywhere. You want to reduce the pain of an audit and some single sources of truth. So, you know, reduction of risk, what does that mean? You know, do you need to, in a mid, you know, mid COVID-19 is a really good example. Um, are you tracking safety? Um, the new kind of requirements and regulations around how people work on site. How are you communicating that? And how are you tracking it to make sure that you're compliant? That certainly reduces risk um, in, in your project and ensuring you've got the controls, um, you know, other, other items like, um, um, is there anything that you have to do regarding tracking diversity? Um, anything of that nature, you know, how are you managing that and how are you storing that so it's easily accessible and certainly reportable? I think the other, the other key takeaway from COVID-19 is a lot of organizations realize they need to modernize um, because they don't necessarily have a system that's accessible in the cloud. Um, being a cloud-based system, it, it just means that it's on at any time and you can log in from anywhere um, as long as you have some sort of internet connectivity. And um, this has been so significant, like even just talking to some of our customers, um, you know, many of our um, government agencies and I've talked to local municipalities and they've talked about the urgency now um, where modernization hasn't been maybe a priority or at the same, um, aggressive pace that has been advanced right because not anticipating a pandemic or certainly being forced to work virtually from a virtual location or work from home was not something that all organizations plan to have to um, transition to in you know a moment's notice um, and we talk about reducing the pain of an audit it's all about project controls and you know what do you have in place to be sure that um, you know anything that's auditable. You know there are some local municipalities here in South Florida where they have a there's a regulation in how quickly they need to pay their subs, and are they how are they tracking that to um, be sure that that's something that is um, not only reportable but they can demonstrate through these documents and demonstrate that they are meeting those regulatory rules. And that's just one example. Um, certainly there are many more. Um, and you need a single source of truth. Um, what version of the document am I working on? Is this the latest set of drawings? Am I, you know, um, marking up the most relevant for that sub or when I respond um, to the, the request for information or that submittal? So all of those things are so important. You guys live this every day, you're aware of it, but just trying to frame some just high level of some of the challenges we see with um, document management and even in a centralized um, format and the importance of not only having a system that controls a lot of this but also um, a best practice as well. So just a few more things on document management, um, some of the basics and then I'm going to hand this over to Mike Weber. But you know when you think about it, a, a, a document, a best practice document management uh, format, you want to make sure that you develop a standard document folder structure and make sure that that structure is something that applies to all of your projects so that as a program, as you uh, maybe respond to audit and things of that nature, it's all seamless and simplistic and everything is managed consistently because that also then teaches a discipline, right, with participants. Um, plan for exceptions. You can't have so much rigidity that you're not, that it stops people from working. So make sure that those uh, exceptions are planned for um, so that you don't develop like a, a six layer, you know, uh, project uh, uh, a a document folder structure. Um, but yet at the same time, you can plan for those exceptions. Leverage automation, and this is, this is key. Um, you know, as much as we may think we're great at what we do, the human element of manual is always um, less attractive. When you have automation in your um, system and the way that you manage these documents, it does allow for uh, better productivity as well as ensuring that your practices and project controls are in place and being followed. Um, obviously, we all understand the need for version control and having the most accurate information. Um, make sure when you're considering, you know, what's going to be your standard and how you do 
how you manage these documents, think about and explore who are the participants, who's going to need access, and how are they going to communicate those documents in where they don't physically sit as an owner, um, but actually a contractor or a sub. And really super important, and I say this is probably one of the most uh, critical aspects as well. It's good to define it and develop a best practice um, document management structure, but certainly you need to train and enforce adherence. And um, this consistency and adherence, people do adopt. You just have to kind of apply some of those change management, you know, um, formats and protocols, but they will adopt and you have to focus on that and, and just really, really be super, like almost belligerent about it um, because that discipline will help with um, all of those kind of four key areas we talked about earlier. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike um, for best practices and examples. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Lisa. I gotta show my screen. Almost there. Okay. Uh, so my name's Mike Weber. I'm a program manager with eBuilder, and I manage one of the teams of business analysts, and those are the folks that are on the ground implementing software alongside of our clients and owners. Lately, it's it's not so much on the ground as it is behind their desks and behind their computers at their at their home office. Um, so, as we go through, uh, as as we work with clients in various verticals, uh, many in the same verticals, it, it, it's readily apparent that uh, f folder structures are like snowflakes. They didn't, they didn't, I've never seen two that are exactly alike across organizations. Uh, in eBuilder, the folder structure is the heart of, of how we manage documents. And one of the things that eBuilder helps you do is standardize the folder structure within your own organization and across your project portfolio. So this is, a, this is an example of one folder structure. And through applying this, uh, this structure to your projects as you create them, you, uh, the system facilitates standardizing your folder structure from project to project. And that makes the transition of moving from project to project easier for your, your PMs and, and the folks uh, on your projects, uh, which translates to a lot of the things that Lisa mentioned, uh, less risk, uh, simplicity, or, or simplifying uh, uh, the process of finding documents, uh, facilitates onboarding new team members if the folder structure uh, is simple and it's consistent on the projects that they're working on. Now, sometimes you do need some flexibility and I have an example here uh, of a public works client where we uh, there's a folder for property acquisitions and we gave the permission for the property acquisition manager um, to maintain uh, their folder structure and their section of the folder structure and create subfolders. And the template included a couple of examples or the first two uh, space holders for parcels, but the, the property acquisition manager can change the labels once they know what the names of those are, and then they can add more uh, on an as needed basis. The key is we've locked down the folder structure, but where we need to, we can open it up and, and give people some control over that structure. Um, so the folder, one of the, one of the um, uh, potential for human error is people filing things in the wrong folders, right? So how do we minimize that? You can, uh, the folder structure can be perfect, but if people are putting things in the wrong place, it makes them harder to find. So in eBuilder, the, the, the document management system or the folder structure is integrated with workflow processes and all the, all the transactions throughout the system. So this is an example of the start step of an invoice approval process or a payout process where the person initiating this process sees this screen, it's, it would typically be your contractor, and there's a field here where they would upload the backup for their invoice. And eBuilder is gonna automatically file that, because we've defined a folder as a default, it's gonna automatically file that in the right spot in the folder structure. And this is regardless, irrespective of what project the contractor is, is starting this process, it's gonna always go to the same folder within that project. Here's another example of a, a design review process where you've got a designer submitting uh, drawings and specs for review and these could be these could each go to a separate default folder each one of these files 
uh, here I'm just showing an example where, where we've defaulted them to one folder. So pretty consistent as to where to go in each one of your projects if you're looking for the, uh, the planning documents or the conceptual design documents and specs on your project. Um, Lisa mentioned version control. So here's an example where I uploaded three versions of the same document, which means the same document name, uh, and eBuilder automatically versions. So it's here we've got three versions, automatically versions the file. Uh, so if you click on, in this case, uh, schematic drawings, you're, you're going to get automatically the latest version of the file. But if you want to find out and view previous versions, they're all right here. Um, what I find at many clients is the uh, there's something in the name of the file that just doesn't um, that makes it unique, like a date that it was uploaded or a date it was revised. Well, in eBuilder, versioning works when the file name is the same and you upload the file into eBuilder, it'll version it. There is the ability to add the date that it was revised in a separate field so that you can have, uh, you, you, cannot, you can go with the same name and have the versioning work for you. Uh, so I, I find this is one area that clients have the most challenge with is getting away from having so much intelligence built into the file name. But if they can get there, eBuilder gives you a way to manage that by using the description when you upload a file, you put uh, whatever that identifying information is, the initials of the person who's uploading it, the date it's uploaded, the date, it, the date of the revision, whatever it is that people are now burying in the file name. Um, history. So eBuilder tracks the history of everything that is done or happens to a document. So here um, I checked in a document, which means I created it initially. I viewed it. I emailed it to myself. And I'm going to show you uh, how that's done. Again, I viewed it a few minutes later. So anyone who comes into eBuilder, even if they only view a file, the, the history is, is, tra is tracked in the, um, in the properties for that file. Um, external and non eBuilder users can participate uh, in the document folder structure in eBuilder. So, your internal users would, would most likely have access to all folders and uh, possibly all folders and all files, but you can control and give access to external users. So, if a contractor were to log into eBuilder, they may see only a subset, maybe even only one or two uh, subfolders in, the folder, in their folder structure. Uh, and that may be because you want them to be able to, to drop drawings or, or submittals directly in the folder structure because there's no process yet for them to initiate um, and use an eBuilder. Um, if they're not an eBuilder user, meaning they don't have a license in your account, you could still send documents to anyone as long as you have an email address. And this is very useful sending documents to anyone, user or non-user, if the document is very large, because some email systems will block large files. So you can send this document as a link to download, and the recipient will get an email with a link, and eBuilder is virtually acting like an FTP or a Dropbox site at that point, and the user can pull the document down to their local machine. Um, another way that uh, anyone can interact with the document folder but also non-users non or people without an eBuilder license, you can enable any folder to receive inbound email. Here's an example of a folder called Email Inbox, and we've, uh, you can modify the name as long as, it's still, as long as it's not used by anyone else in eBuilder. You can change the front end of that email address, and you can give this email address to a small subcontractor or a contractor who may not be an eBuilder or want to be an eBuilder, but yet you want to give them this email address so they could submit their invoice each month. One example that I see a lot uh, out in the field. Uh, let's see. So the last point I wanted to make was audit, uh, control over audits or ease of, of finding documents um, for, for legal action or, or during an audit. So an eBuilder, you don't have to have someone compile and download all the documents to turn over to an auditor or uh, in the event of legal action what you can do is you can actually create a role and this is untypically uh, in this case we call the role audit and we just give that role anyone in that role the permission to view and download files and we can control which folders we, we give that access to it's typically all the all of them 
Uh, and here you can also see your external users, a consultant and a contractor, same concept applies. Anyone that logs into eVoter, you have a granular level at the folder level to control whether they can see it, download it, change it, modify it, whatever the case may be. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dan, and I thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, Michael. I'll just, uh, as soon as I get uh, control here, I'll share my screen. And uh, while that's happening, what I'm gonna do is take everything that Lisa and Michael spoke about and share with you some quotes uh, directly from our customers and how they have uh, how they've done exactly what they're talking about. So, all right. So, really, I titled this "Voice a Customer" because certainly you may feel those that are on the call that we have an ulterior motive to say what we're saying. So, I figured I'd just go ahead and take direct quotes out of our. Uh, existing customer base. So I want to give you two examples. The first one's going to be from a commercial customer, so a private customer. And then the second example is going to be from a public customer. So those of you that are in government, uh, the second example may be more germane. Those that are in the private sector, this example may be more germane. But what you're going to see is there's an incredible amount of overlap of the fundamental value that having a cloud-based document management system will provide for you. So my Private example is Cumberland Farms. That is a uh, convenience store, sometimes slash gas station up here in the Northeast where Matt Sprague and I are from. Uh, Cumbies is how they're also referred to affectionately up here. And so they're one of our more advanced uh, private owners. And so what I wanna do is give you some quotes of what they said during a webinar, which we can share with you a link to that webinar. It's something we did uh, last year of what was life like before they implemented a document management system. And so I'd ask everybody scan through this quote because I have to believe if you have not implemented a system yet, that some part of this quote, if not the whole thing will, will, uh, um, will resonate with you. And that is, we have documents on one drive, we have emails on another, photos on a separate one. So basically the point is their digital documents are spread all over the place. And then on top of that, they have paper documents, which are of course stored physically in, in another location. And then I, I love this one. Have I seen the pitfalls of this time and time again, where people, and this is a specific example. So Michael talked about invoicing. In this example, there were proposals submitted by a vendor, and then Cumberland Farms was taking that proposal and then entering, entering in. In this example, they were entering it into eBuilder but it could be you're entering it into your ERP system or your accounts uh, payable system. And the information they were entering specifically around the value of this commitment was wrong because the person had the wrong version of the document. So Michael showed you the auto versioning. So he had three versions. And the point is, if you go into eBuilder and you click on the file, we will only give you the latest version. So it's not possible to repeat this mistake if you implement a document management system. So what were some of the quotes after the implementation? And that is you can find and access files a thousand times easier. So again, these are their, their words, not ours, a thousand times easier. So one of the things that I'd like you to reflect on is if you even think about the icons that were in the example that Michael gave, I would argue that if you were, if you're like 30 years or younger in age, you probably don't even understand what those icons actually represent. Similarly, my kids come to me sometimes and they say, what's that icon on the save button? And I have to tell them, well, that's a floppy disk. So we still today have applications that use a floppy disk as the save icon, even though I haven't seen a floppy disk in 10 years. And the same thing with those manila envelopes that are on the folder structure, because in the old days, you took paper and you stuffed them into those envelopes, and then you stuffed those envelopes into file cabinets. That's why we call these files and folders. And yet it's a holdover to the old way of doing things you don't even need anymore. In fact, I would argue, if you think about the way you search for information on Google, especially if you're looking for a document, like for me recently it was tax time, so I was looking for tax documents. The reality is those documents are stored in a folder structure, but I never see that folder structure. I say what I'm looking for, the system comes back 
with the document I'm looking for. I click it, I download it. Unbeknownst to me, behind that is a document management system. And that's what eBuilder lets you do. Although what Michael showed you is a way that people will navigate and look and click through folders to find stuff. You don't need to do that because we have a search function that will find it for you. You can access information remotely. So Lisa mentioned this, especially today in work from home. I don't know those of you who are following the news, but uh, Google just announced that they will not return to the office until June of 2021. So a year from now is when they'll return back to the office. So anybody who's been holding on to the fact that I don't need to invest in a document management system, because eventually we'll all be back in the office and have access to our internal file server, uh, that's not going to happen. So you need to be thinking about cloud-based technologies. Michael showed that ability to, rather than emailing a file, you email a link and that link people click to download that file. And the beauty of that paradigm is not only you're not clogging your email or potentially having an issue where the person can't receive your email, but you also have the benefit of you'll get an audit hit that that person downloaded that file. So you'll know for a fact that they received the file that you sent them. And then finally, this is also a manifestation of one of the features that Michael showed you, which is the GCs were posting their documents to a process. So that's the workflow that he showed and they're automatically saved to the correct folder. So time and time and time again, I hear about people or hear from people that can't find things because somebody put it in the wrong folder. And you're gonna see that in my public example, the exact same issue. And this point, and I'll give you the rest of the dot, dot, dot here, but the blame game all but disappeared. Who wouldn't like to stop playing the blame game? Hopefully most of you don't like that game. So I call this my quote of the day. It's an old uh, game we used to play at a prior company that when we visited customers, you'd have to come back. What was the biggest quote you received from that day? So this was an instance where what the person from Cumberland Farm, Susan mentioned is, she went back to one of her former critics. So I underlined former because that means they were a critic and now they're actually a proponent of the system. And what they love is version control. And specifically at the bottom part here, construction had the wrong plan, fingers were being pointed, and nobody was being held accountable. If that statement resonates with you, you need to start looking at a document management system because there's the quote that I had on the last slide, the blame game all but disappeared. And then finally at the bottom here, the main benefit directly from Cumberland Farms is that it eliminated confusion, it added transparency and accountability, and it created a better, more collaborative environment. So who doesn't want that? So that's the example that I have for you from a private sector company. Now I wanna transition into the New Jersey Department of Transportation. Hopefully I don't have to tell you what they do. Uh, and these are, what was life like for them before the implementation of a document management system? And this one I love, the wild goose chase. Who here on the phone hasn't been part of this wild goose chase? I need to go find something, not quite sure where people put it, Maybe they put it in the wrong place or even worse, they didn't put it anywhere. So it's sitting on their local laptop or on their desk. So you go through this wild goose chase trying to find documentation. In prior lives, I had customers tell me that wild goose chase could cost their company 50, 100, in certain instances, $150,000 because they couldn't find a document to substantiate a position that they, need, that they were gonna take in a claim. Therefore, they had to settle a claim, even they know for a fact that they were not in the wrong. So, and when it comes to uh, cost, so this is one talking about the physical world for toner, for printing things out physically. So converting something that was digital into a physical piece of paper. So toner, office supplies, printers, printer cost, et cetera. And then, so what, uh, what uh, Scott said from the Jersey DOT is a huge savings when they went to moving things to uh, digital. And this is also an example of, uh, of or manifestation of what Michael talked about is this consistent folder structure. If you're not driving consistency and project manager A has built their own folder structure and then that project manager leaves a project and then I come onto that project, I can guarantee you the first thing I'm gonna do is reorganize that entire folder structure because that folder structure was built the way project manager A thinks, not the way I think. So if you drive standardization, I don't have to worry about how you want to file documents versus how I want to file documents. We have an agreed upon way that we will file documents. 
So as far as what life was like after the implementation, so again, being able to find information. So there's that, that bifurcation I talked about. The fact that you can find it because you know how to navigate through the folder structure. I call that the unsophisticated hunt and peck method. So I'm gonna click through folders to find it, or you use the search capability and let the system go find it. So it was a huge, huge benefit. And this is an example that Michael also talked about, about the naming convention becomes far less important. Putting a date at the end of the file. Why do you put dates at the end of the file? Because you wanna know if it's the latest file. Well, you don't need to do that because we'll assure you that you're working with the latest file. Also naming conventions are put into place, very sophisticated naming conventions. The more sophisticated your convention is, the less likely it is people are gonna follow it or follow it correctly. So with the implement of e implementation of eBuilder, he actually used this, I like this. I could, it could be named supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, some ridiculous file name, but I know for a fact that later on when I gotta go find that file, I can short search for key attributes. Like I know it's a, it's a soil boring report, then I search for soil boring report and that document will come back even though it was named supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. So those were the benefits from the New Jersey DOT. Uh, so with that, that was the end of what I wanted to talk about. I invite the other panelists to come back on for our Q&A session. But again, I wanted to give you a sample from a public sector as well as a private sector. And hopefully you saw where there was overlap between the pains that we solved. All right, Matt. Thank so you. So Lisa and Michael, come on back. We almost got them all. There we go. We got everybody. Even Evan joined us. Fantastic. So I've been uh, ferociously working here, uh, answering questions, but also uh, curating them a little bit. Um, I'll actually I've categorized one real quick, which I believe would be more of a, a technical question. So this might be a, a quick hit, uh, but if it also spurs on any other ideas, feel free to elaborate. Uh, but the question was, can I control through user roles who has access to create, edit, delete folder structures? Who wants to take it? Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah, the, the role right down to the, at the role level, for each folder, you can define the ability to create which or upload a, a document to start with, version it, delete it, um, redline it, um, copy it or move it to another folder, um or have no access at all so yes perfect yeah and sorry right. matt the only thing i want to layer in because that exact topic was discussed in the webinar i referred to susan talked about that and what's beautiful about lisa and michael's team is they can help you understand the pros and cons so one of the things that susan had mentioned is they were going to go with a super super detailed down to the folder and file level role and permission and the eBuilder team walked them back from that cliff saying, you can do that. Maybe not the best idea, and here's why. And one of her things was, if you decide to buy eBuilder and implement eBuilder, listen to the team. They have a lot of experience. And a couple of times when they didn't, they came back later and said, I wish I had listened to those guys. So um, kind of the kind of now I went to the, the gritty detail. Now I'm going to go actually above document management to a concern that was brought up by three or four different questions uh, surrounding uh, data security in terms of where we're hosted, uh, what options we have for data security. Uh, and in addition, um, you know, the, I think there was one that actually said that they don't they're currently not allowed to have anything hosted in the cloud. Um, but how do we how do we uh, handle those type of concerns? Lisa, you well, want to start that one? Yeah, I mean, I can. I'll start that one. So I think um, when we start talking about security and data security, um, and if there's legislation based on your organization or uh, you know some governance that doesn't allow you to um, host data in a cloud-based environment. Um, I would ask that, is that necessarily true for all cloud-based environments? Because there are different types. There are some that have more security that is at a different level of regulatory requirements. It's not your standard AWS um, cloud. There's levels of security. So there's a, a, a government level of security or a federal space level of security. And so you want to make sure that the PMIS system that you go with, that they do offer the multiple 
um, kind of restricted areas of AWS, what they offer to address the security needs. So that's, if some, that's something that I'm not sure if you're aware of or not, but there are levels, if you will. Um, I think when it comes to security overall, um, we absolutely have all the security um, protocols in place. We, you know, do our SOC audit and um, each of our customers typically when they decide or in the process of deciding and selecting us to do business with, there is an element of that. So we do expose information and we share that um, with you. And typically there are multiple people that may ask that question from IT to other governing bodies within your organization. So that is something that is something that we do respond to and we expose that information. And I'm just trying to answer that broadly, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think the only part I would, I would layer in is we have uh, numerous government clients. Uh, we have a handful of federal level clients and uh, some of those deal with incredibly sensitive information. And uh, as Lisa had mentioned, we have all the way from standard security to something through the GSA called GovCloud, all the way up to FedRAMP. Uh, so if your organization forbids the use of, of uh, cloud-based solutions, then uh, I feel bad for you. Uh, but oh, right. <laughs> and maybe that's something. So one thing is an example just to follow up on. So we worked with a, a large um, agency that pretty much was responsible for construction across their state. And there as a governing body, legislation prohibited any type of digital signature as an approval is an example. And because this organization was really driving through and uh, modernizing, you know, at the support level of the governor down, um, it was it was amazing to see how legislation changed to adhere to some of our more advanced technology that's in place today and adopted that. So in the past where they said, no, nope, electronic signatures are not legal signatures, um, we saw this organization go and change legislation and um, and then move to a digi digital um signature as an accepted legal signature. So I think that this time, and especially now the sensitivity uh, and the impact of COVID-19, it, it may be changing and how and what's required to change and kind of move into the, the current digital age. Right, and so what the thing along that though, what I would strongly encourage, because where I see this is things like, uh, solutions like Dropbox that was mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. there are, uh, reactions to those type of technologies uh, that don't apply to eBuilder. And I would agree, I think Lisa mentioned, if you're looking at a solution, this is an area you need to dig in deep with your provider. Because uh, I can tell you, we have spent a lot of time and we have spent a lot of money to have the level of security we do. And the average solution out there will not have spent the time, nor will they have spent the money. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so another question was, how does um, so how does eBuilder specifically our document management functionality work with uh, different ERPs, SAP for example? Mike, you want to take it? Um, so we we have eBuilder uh, can interface to an ERP system um, through uh, APIs or uh, or and other methods. But typically what we'll do is if we send trans, if there is an interface that has transactional data, there's typically some attachments that go along with it and we can transmit, we have the technology now to transmit those through the API, but through APIs along with the transactional data so that it's all still tied together in the ERP system. Um, so I, I guess that's uh, that's what comes to mind. Right, kind of that integration, right? Because you, I mean, I think Mike, you've already touched on. There's ways, right, to get to um, communicate with eBuilder, even if you don't have a license, right? And then right. if you start talking about system to system communication, that's typically just um, through an integration. I'm not sure I'm aware ever of a, a financial system maybe sending a file on its own without some. You have to have an integration. There's got to yeah. be a way to transmit that. Um, for the systems to talk and that's through integration and that is definitely something that um, we support and we see often so there is a low-tech solution every document in eBuilder has a, a link a url and you can store that url in your financial system if you've got a place to do it and click through 
uh, you'd have to have credentials to get into eBuilder to see the document if, if you click that link. Uh, and there are also public links to every document. So you can uh, open up folders and documents for public um, through a public link where you don't need to have eBuilder access um, or credentials to get in. And uh, it's it's a public registration. You decide what the user, what credentials the user needs to uh, supply if they do click that public link and try to view something that you've enabled. So those are that's those are more low tech solutions. Cool. All right. So uh, another um, more general eBuilder question, um, Dan. This might be one that's going to be lobbed up for you. I know you love to talk about this. So uh, is this system considered a pure FTP site? and a competitor to Procore and Submittal Exchange for construction project documents for collaboration and for, uh, and for record? Sure, so uh, my initial answer to that is, if you're an owner organization, then the answer to the question is no, because I don't consider Procore to be a competitor. Uh, they're not in the same class. There are, that's a solution for general contractors. So again, if you're a pure owner, the answer to the question is no. And I would put Submittal Exchange in the same bucket. Uh, now, if you're a contractor, we have a whole different platform for you. We have a Trimble project site, which does compete directly with Procore. And then I would say yes, competes directly with Submittal Exchange. So in those instances, those instances I would say yes. However, eBuilder does have all the capabilities from an owner's perspective of managing submittals and managing all of the documentation that a solution like Procore manages, but the way an owner acts and the way a contractor acts is very, very different. There are material and substantial differences. So I would never try to sell either of those solutions to the other marketplace. Great. Um, so a question came in around, um, is there an option to ping an author of a document that is time to review or update a document? or on like a predefined time frame? Uh, so there is the ability to subscribe to a folder or a branch of folders. So if anything happens in those folders, you get notified. You can also subscribe to reports, which would, um, and you can report on uh, the dates uh, that the doc, the, the report can include um, documents that were uploaded more than 90 days ago or documents with a certain attribute within a uh, date attribute or within the next 60 days. So yes, you can through, uh, through that mechanism, through the reporting mechanism. So if I could ask a, a little bit of, an, of a different flavor of that question, Michael or Lisa, as far as, although our focus today was on document management specifically, we did touch a little bit on another core capability of eBuilder, which is the processes. So, uh, the question I would have for you two is if we had built a process that was sending a document through an approval, can you set due dates of, I've assigned this to Lisa, she needs to review it. Can I say, Lisa, you have seven days to review this uh, and then she'll be notified that, it's, that she needs to review it. And then as her due date comes, will she get notified again? yeah that's that's possible there's escalation through escalation rules i can even configure it so that lisa's boss gets notified if she doesn't review that document <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks mike <laughs> right under the bus. not that i would not that i would go that far <laughs> well but 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 a story that i heard so i don't know if this is a friend of a friend story but it was an example of one time that the ceo of intel got a notification that he needed to approve an invoice for a box of staples. And it was an example where it went through nine levels of escalation because people just weren't paying attention. And that he came back and said, this better never happen again. But he was impressed that it made it all the way to his desk. So. <laughs> and we, you know, and it's funny because we also had a customer, um, the, a customer here in South Florida, again, a local municipality, and it's it was it's a regulation and I, I can't remember now it's been several years if it was county driven or city but there was local legislation that requires all of their contractors to be paid within a time period and it was less than 30 days um and from the time that the uh, pay app was submitted and through ebuilder they were able to manage that where it historically 
they would be out of compliance, and right? Because it's just hard to track that and to make sure that you're turning around and approving payment that quickly. But um, through the use of eBuilder, that was one of the things that um, that was really um, that just just changed the way that uh, they had to manage their business and being compliant with their contractors. And you know the importance of that um, to track good contractors. It was uh, it improved you know 100%. So that was like some immediate value when adding some rules around notification and escalations that really worked well for that organization. And then the other thing I remember is that that also gives you the opportunity now that you're tracking it to get trend analysis to know if you're trending to go into a non-compliance. So before right. eBuilder, they didn't even know how bad out of compliance they were. With eBuilder, they were able to get into compliance and ensure they don't go back out of compliance. That's just another advantage of putting a system in place. Right. And I think a recent example, and I think that now, certainly post COVID-19, um, everyone's looking at their programs, right? And they're looking at how are they managing them and where can they drive efficiencies and reduce costs. And so recently in a conversation with a, a, a senior level exec at a very large healthcare facility, um, headquartered out in Nashville, but they're, na they're national, um, shared with me, you know, the importance of them being able to track information um, on their subs. And um, one of those things, you know, around their subs is, you know, location, and they track some key metrics to determine how the, the sub is performing or the contractor is performing, um, including tracking diversity, right? Because that's, that's a big thing as well. So it was amazing to see now saying, okay, we're a national organization and some of these contractors or GCs that we work with are national. Um, but yet, of course, there's multiple GCs that they work with, and they're almost rating them based on how they perform. And so I think the way that we're looking at data, it's even at that next level down. And the way they're doing that is bringing that information in, obviously, through documentation and extracting key information out of that. So there's a lot of ways, and I know we're talking beyond just document management, but more data, but it is, um, it, it is inter, inter, you know, interlinked, intertwined. I can't think of the word I'm looking for. <laughs> you understand. <laughs> so uh, a question that's kind of revolving around um, uh, COVID. Sorry, Remote. I had to interrelated. I had to just get the right word out there. Sorry. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so this question is uh, pertaining to COVID and remote working. Uh, what are the impacts of having a, a PMIS, especially during the remote working situation like today? Uh, you know what? I realized I forgot a slide. Uh, I don't know, uh, Kellen, if you could cue me up again. I have a slide that's going to answer that question. Uh, we did a, a, a six-part webinar series starting in April through May called The New Normal in Construction. And, uh, and the, the slide that I had forgotten about is quotes that I teased out that talked about uh, the impact. So what this was is a question we asked our panelists. We had eight unique panelists over the six week period. And we asked each one of them, what would life have been like if you had not in, in, uh, invested in, for them it was all eBuilder. So let's be honest, we're, we're, we're from eBuilder, talking about eBuilder, but we said just, if you hadn't implemented something, if you're just doing the, the, the old way of doing things. And so we said, what would life have been like? And, and uh, I have a, a bunch of quotes, but basically the, the, the Reader's Digest version, the summary was, uh, we would have been screwed. So that's as simple as I can make it. And the specific examples, one, one that Evan and I spoke with, talked about the, the impact of COVID was uh, budget reductions. So they knew they were gonna have to look at their project intake. So the projects that were coming down the pipeline, and reevaluate what projects are they going to do and not do based on a reduced a reduced funding. And what they what the gentleman we spoke with said is as fast as the finance team could say what if we do this, I would give them the answer from a funding and cash flow perspective. So he's able to cash flow these what if scenarios. He said without eBuilder, I would have told them don't call me. I have no idea. I'd just be making stuff up. Uh, the other examples were access to uh, documents. So we talked about the fact that it's cloud-based. You have access from documents from anywhere. By the way, anywhere means from home. So 
companies that had not implemented something like an e-builder when they went home couldn't get access to documents. We had one uh, school that, uh, and by the way, e-builder wouldn't have solved this problem, but it just, it, it baffles me that people allow their organizations to get into the state. None of their employees had laptops and the state forbade them from telling the employees to use their home computers because that's not uh, state property and you can't ask an employee to use private equipment. So they couldn't access any files. So they basically shut down for a month until they figured that out. Uh, I don't know many businesses can survive shutting down for a month. So uh, those are the two examples here. And if I get uh, control here, I'll, I'll show those quotes. But those are the two that jump top of mind for me. So I don't know, Lisa or Michael, anything on your part? I mean, Michael, do you want to go, Mike? It's a similar story. We, we were working with a, a local government agency here and they didn't have laptops, um, but they were halfway through the e-builder e implementation. So when they had to work from home, um, enough of them had someone at the house that had a computer. Um, and uh, after they wrestled it out of the hands of their kids and they got the computer, they had a system they could actually log into and, and work uh, by, by working through e-builder. Yeah, and I think, um, and so we we heard a lot of stories of, from our customers about just the just the, the the difficulty in just shifting to a remote work environment, um, and certainly having cloud based um, application e builder to log into was was something that solved the pain that they didn't have to incur or plan for. I think the other thing in e builder, it's um, if there's a way that you can communicate to um, all every participate in eBuilder. Um, there's an announcements um, um, space where you could actually communicate. And so it was. A, it's a great way to continue to collaborate. And this is obviously beyond document management, but just when we're talking about systems, that there was a way to do that and, and collaborate and give instructions to people um, and employees that are logging into eBuilder to have visibility to that. So that also adds to you know communication and collaboration. Yeah, and the other thing, so I, I have the slide up on my screen anyway. So one, University of Southern California was one of the examples. They said, we're using eBuilder to help with project intake analysis. So that's, again, looking at the projects that were in planning phase, not yet execution. And they spoke with other universities in their network. And they said, it's what's taking them days to do, we accomplish in 15 minutes. So, uh, and then the other one was uh, Porter Tacoma was also using the COVID time. Now, these are quotes from three months ago. So some of this you would have already done, but they also were using this time to drop paper-based processes because if you're all sitting in your house, unless you're going to rely on the on mail and you're going to stuff stuff in the mail and mail a piece of paper around, uh, you can't use paper anymore. So it allowed organizations, to Lisa's point, all the way to the, of making legislative changes, but also challenging uh, stick in the mud. That's the way we've always done it. Uh, so we have to do things in paper. We have to do the process this way. And so they use this time to say, well, you can't, just can't do it the old way. It's not physically possible. So let's, uh, let's innovate. So those were a couple of the, uh, and one of them uh, from Vanderbilt University, please, please have eBuilder because without it currently, uh, we would have had to stop working. So that's the answer to that question, Matt, for me. Well, I'm being told that is a perfect wrap-up point uh, for today's webinar. We have completely exhausted all the audience's questions. So uh, virtual clap to our presenters, Dan, Michael, and Lisa. Thank you so much for putting together today's presentation and participate, participating in the Q&A. Couple two quick administrative items before we let everyone go today. Number one, I dropped a link in the chat. Lisa put together a super, super <laughs> expansive definitive guide to document management. So if you wanna dive a little bit deeper into this topic, you can follow that link, tab it, share it with a coworker or a friend. It's super deep, well thought out, and uh, I've read it myself, so I really enjoyed it. Um, second, one other objection, sorry. There was one other question, which feeds into what you just said. Okay, um, perfect. Was, um is there anywhere we can see any other webinars that we've hosted um so other resources so if you go to e-builder.net on the top 
banner, you'll see an area called resources. When you click on that, there's an area for on-demand webinars. So any of our other webinars, including this one, will be available in that area. Thank you for that, because my second point is a great segue from that. If you want to, if you want to view this webinar on demand or share it with a friend later, this will be available both on our website and it will be sent over email to you. So with that said, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dan, for today's webinar, Driving Successful Document Management in Construction. Thank you to everybody who attended today. Uh, we hope you're staying safe and, and well in this uncertain time. So enjoy the rest of your week and we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.